people in, in your own communities and, and acknowledging um, the hopes and dreams of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as well. I'm Lynn O'Grady and I'm um, a facilitator for this evening and I've been doing a number of these facilitation um, of these webinars over the last couple of years and, and really enjoy the opportunity it provides for us to, to get into some, some difficult and often interesting um, topics and, and really be able to tease out what it might mean for us as practitioners. So I'm a psychologist, I work um, mostly at the Australian Psychological Society, I'm a national project manager for a couple of projects here, Kids Matter and the Forced Adoption um, Project. I um, also supervise some psychology interns and so the issue of, of bullying in the workplace is something that I guess as a psychologist and certainly as a supervisor it does come up in, in various ways. So I'm very aware of it but I certainly not, don't have the expertise that the people on the panel um, do have tonight so that's, that's why they're here which is, which is fabulous. You um, would have seen the panellists' um, bios so you would have already had a look at those but we will um, we will go through individually and, and just introduce you so you get to get to see who we're going to um, have taking us through their, their presentations and answering some of the, the many questions that we have. We'll get through as many of those as we can. So I'd like to begin with introducing Dr Anne Wise and Anne is an Occupational Health and Safety Consultant. She's based in New South Wales in the Blue Mountains. She was just, just telling us and I imagine it's very cold up there. Um, and I understand you've worked for more than 30 years as an Occupational Health, Safety, Management and Education Consultant. And you're often called upon to be an expert witness for workplace bullying. Um, what's actually involved in that? What does it mean to be a workplace um, expert witness? Well, the court requires that you absolutely have the competence to um, answer the questions that you're asked to answer as an expert witness. So um, you need to have expertise, knowledge, and a deal of experience in the field. If um, if a person gets to the point where they want to sue their employer or attempt to sue their employer at common law, for example, because they've been bullied in the workplace, um, then the lawyers will generally call for an expert opinion on the evidence that exists. Right. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. Sounds very important and um, challenging work. And um, yeah. Our next panelist is Dr Neil Azani. Now I'm not even sure if I've got that name right Neil, you'll have to tell me if that's right or not. Neil's from Western Australia, so we're on a different time zone to me here in Melbourne. And Neil's an occupational physician and work cover approved medical specialist. And Neil, you do a lot of on-site consulting. So what does that involve? I love that. I go out to see the worker in their workplace, see what they do. Um, the things I like best is seeing how they got injured and then how to help them get better and use their workplace to help them get better. I particularly enjoy that. Right. Um, okay. To meet the workers, their colleagues, their managers, their, the, the work they do and it, um, it's the best way to get the best result, I think. Um, correct, okay. correct way to say my name is Ozan. And, okay. um, Ozan as in Anne that we just met. And, oh. <laughs> um, and uh, I mentioned I'm an occupational physician. I've been doing occupational medicine like wholly for 10 years and before and got about 25 years of cradle to the great grave GP experience which is where most of my comments tonight will be coming from from the GP yeah. perspective. Yeah, sure. Great. But I can give well, occupational yeah. physician um, input as well. Mm. Okay. Yeah, that's great. So it sounds like very hands-on work in terms of getting getting a real picture of what's going on for people as well as the GP experience. So that, that sounds really useful for tonight, so thank you. And apologies about the, the surname. <coughs> Might have just confused me though if I'd been thinking of Anne too much. Um, let's move on to Dr Nigel Strauss. And Nigel, you're a Victorian-based occupational psychiatrist and you have an interest in post-traumatic stress disorder and workplace stress. What are some of the common issues that cause workplace stress? It's just a little question to start the night. Yeah, it's a big question to begin with. Well, yeah. there's a number, a, a number of factors, as yeah. I think everyone's aware. Um, but um, I think the main thing is that um, employers look after their employees, and often when they, there's something wrong with the workplace environment, that's usually the basis of the stress, and there's a number of factors that can be responsible for that. Um, and I think as a psychiatrist and dealing with employers and employees, I just always try and uh, make sure that relationships are good. And once relationships are good, then the chances of stress developing um, are limited. Um, and that's a tall order, of course, but if people are cooperative and organisations are cooperative, you do get good results. Yeah, great. 
Right. Okay, so that fits really nicely with our, our early intervention focus tonight as well. So that, that's another great contribution that you'll be making. And last, but certainly not least, Peter Cotton. Dr Peter Cotton, you're a Victorian clinical organisational psychologist. And you specialise in how the work environment can influence employee mental health and you've been involved with the CSIRO over the last three years to assist them implement recommendations from an independent review for bullying improvement. Interesting idea. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Oh, um, CSIRO's done a lot of really good work in this space. Um, however, uh, I've been working with them for five years, but it's a bit difficult when, uh, in the last couple of years, governments have um, broadsided with uh, various cuts and uh, changes CEO. So that all trickles down and affects what we're doing. But we work through that as best we can. Yep. Okay. Great. Thanks, Peter. And again, you can see already that I guess the way that these MHPN webinars work is this multidisciplinary approach. So bringing together a whole lot of, of different backgrounds and experiences of people that, that then we'll work our way through this, this interesting case study tonight. So you've already got a little taste of what, what we're going to be in for tonight from the panel. I'm not sure whether people have, um, we've got 570 people joining us now and I'm not sure whether people have participated in these webinars before and, and know how it works. So I'll just do a bit of a a rundown of, of how things are working and hopefully I can see people have been chatting and, and introducing themselves in, in the general chat box. So you've obviously found that, which is good. And that, that is a chance for you to ask some questions, ask some comments, um, certainly introduce yourself, say hello to each other if you see a name of someone you recognise. Talking about the weather is, is always interesting. Um, but be mindful that it's a public space. And so whilst this is a, a virtual environment, I guess the way I like to think about this is, is that we're in a <coughs> space together. And it's a public space. It's a professional development environment. So just be mindful that your general chat is, is public. And so just being, being aware of that and, um, and thinking about it as if we were in a face-to-face -face space room. Some people love the chat and really get into it and other people find it really annoying and distracting. So find that it's very hard to keep up with, with all the information that's being um, talked about and that the panellists are talking about and keeping up with the slides. So, and then the chat as well can be a bit distracting for people. So you determine what's going to work for you and you can use the little arrow at the top of, the, of that um, panel, that section up there, that you can actually reduce that and you can, you can get rid of that. Um, or for a little while and bring it back on later if you want to. So it's up to you for um, how you manage that. If you have any technical um, problems, we, we have fantastic support and one of the things about doing these webinars is the level of professionalism behind the scenes. And we have people from MHPN who are going to be doing moderating and we'll be answering some of your questions and, and helping you with um, any of those questions around where things are or um, any, any sort of questions they're able to, to respond to. You've got technical support, you can see the technical help um, box there that's flashing, so that that's where you ask if, you, if you're losing sound or there's something not quite right in, in there, you, you um, ask for some technical help in there. So just using those those chats as, um, as you know, well as you can and know that there's people there that can, that can support you. And of course this webinar will be recorded and available later on, so you'll be able to um, be able to get it later if, if for some reason you know you, you have to um, finish early. There'll be a survey exit survey at the end, which we really like you to fill out. It gives us really good feedback so that we continue to to learn and develop, and also feedback um, in terms of um, the content. There's a little folder down in the bottom right corner, which does have a, some resources. So it has the slide, it has the presentation, it has um, the case studies. If you haven't had a chance to look at that. And it also and there's a little arrow flashing showing you where that is, and um, also has some um, information there for you as well, some resources that the panelists might, might be talking about. Now, the webinar has been made possible through funding provided by Safe Work Australia, and there's the web the website there, for Safe Work Australia yeah. webinar yeah. Yeah. Can, um, website that you can you can see to access more information as well. Uh, just in terms of um, self-care, I, th I think it's really important when we're doing these webinars just to acknowledge that some of the people who are joining us tonight or looking at, at the webinar later on may have found themselves in a, in a difficult work environment. Workplaces can be challenging and we're going to be talking a lot about that tonight and people may have had their own experiences for themselves or people close to them that they've supported um, who have experienced their own bullying. Um, so we really wanted to be mindful of that and, and I guess again we're not able to deal with individual um, situations so the chat box isn't for sharing personal information or, or particular um, cases tonight, that's not the purpose. But just to, I guess to 
alert people that there may be some things that are talked about that you know the nature of the topic might might be a bit challenging or, or be a bit triggering for people. So be mindful of your own self care, what it is you, you need to do to be able to look after yourself in this in this kind of environment. So um, hopefully that um, you know that's something that you can be prepared for and, and ready for to do what, what will work for you. The learning outcomes, and again this is um, information that's been distributed um, beforehand. And the first um, learning outcome, we've, we've kind of thought a bit more about defining what bullying, workplace bullying might mean. So we're going to be spending that and that, we think that's going to be a bit of a um, learning outcome as well as to be thinking what is it that we're actually talking about. So we'll be adding that to the list as well. Um, so what does workplace bullying and harassment mean? What about the legal context that um, is including how to report, where to notify, how to access information? So we're going to be adding that into that um, learning outcomes as well as the others, which is around implementing best practice and strategies to improve successful early intervention to better support people experiencing bullying in the workplace and just stressing again that notion of early intervention. So not waiting until people are really um, in, in great trouble but catching, catching these um, issues as early as we can. Identifying challenges, tips and strategies and providing a collaborative response to supporting the social and emotional wellbeing of people who are experiencing bullying in the workplace. And we know that people really like strategies, they like things that they can take away from these sessions. So I think there'll be a real mix of that. There'll be a mix of some of the research and some of the things that we've learned and people on the panel have learned over time and are working on. But I think there will be some, some really important ideas and strategies for people to take away as well. Before we um, launch into the presentations, I'm hoping people have seen the case study and had a chance to read it because it forms the basis of um, the discussion, I guess. So the panelists have been asked to use the case study as the basis of their presentation. So I'll just do a brief recap um, before we I hand across to Anne to to kick off the panel discussion for tonight. Um, so Mary is is a person of fictional case study. Uh, Mary is um, the person we'll be talking about. She's 46 years old. She's a nurse unit manager, and she reports to supervisor Alice. And Mary's been in this role for 10 years, and she's always been very confident. Um, she's married, has four children, and she she plays netball. Um, Mary's been well respected by her colleagues and since Alice has been appointed as a supervisor three months ago, Mary's been questioned and challenged by Alice about her decision. So there's been a real shift since um, Alice started. Um, and some of the things uh, Alice has often questioned Mary in front of her staff, directly contradicting her. Um, Alice has singled Mary out in meetings. And, and this is impacting on Mary and she's starting to second guess her ability and at home she's starting to, to drink alcohol to alleviate the stress that she's feeling. So it's starting to impact on, on her uh, ability to cope. Um, she's not confiding in, in pe with people, she's not sharing this with people at the moment. Um, she's missed some netball games, she dreads the alarm going off in the morning, which I can understand, especially these mornings, but for, for Mary it's, it's a dread around um, not wanting to go to work and fear about what's happening for her. At work she's avoiding Alice and she's, she's starting to have some physical signs, she's, she's feeling nauseous at work. Um, and recently Alice confirmed Mary's fears when the performance appraisal, um, Alice gave her a poor rating, implied she needed to lift her game or the position would be in jeopardy. So there's this real threat hanging over her now. So she's feeling low in mood and her sleep is starting to be affected. Her husband has noticed that despite her trying to hide this from him. He's noticed that and he's insisting that she go to the GP. And once she arrives at the DP's um, rooms, she finally reveals what's happening. So that's, that's setting the scene. Now let's hand across to you, Anne, and you can give us an occupational health and safety consultant perspective and you're going to begin with a bit of definitional information for us to help set the scene a bit further. Thanks, Lynn. My first job is to uh, briefly present the legal and definitional context of this discussion. Obviously there's um, only time to speak about this in very general terms. <coughs> the workplace bullying behaviour is accepted across Australia as a psychosocial hazard. And by the term hazard, we mean anything that has the potential to harm the health or safety of a person. Health in the work health and safety legal context refers to physiological and psychological health. The hazard in the case of workplace bullying is the abusive behaviour not the person employing it. Although there are some differences between Australian jurisdictions in work health safety law, each jurisdiction assigns duties of care to all the players in the workplace setting. So this includes directors, managers, employees, contractors and others. The employer has a general duty of care to provide employees with safe working environments, 
and safe systems of work. Sorry, my phone just fell over. <laughs> okay. Several terms are sometimes used mistakenly and interchangeably in discussions about workplace bullying, and they include the terms conflict, harassment, and bullying. They've got different meanings and they have different remedies. So let's just define these terms. Conflict at work denotes differences of opinion and disagreements. It happens constantly with and in between groups of people. It's not necessarily bad. It uh, can often lead to creative solutions to problems if the, if the conflictual opinions are harnessed properly. However, if it's not managed over time, unresolved conflict may lead or escalate into workplace bullying. Harassment denotes unwanted behaviour that intimidates, offends or humiliates and can lead to less favourable treatment of the people or the people uh, persons being targeted. It's relevant to some characteristic of the people targeted such as gender, sexual preference, marital status, age, status as a carer, race, disability and so on as listed in the anti-discrimination literature in each jurisdiction. Sorry, the anti-discrimination legislation, not literature. Um, harassing behaviour, unlike bullying, does not have to be repeated. It can be a one-off episode. Safe Work Australia provides the following definition of workplace bullying. It's defined as repeated and unreasonable behaviour directed towards a worker or a group of workers that creates a risk to health and safety. And all three of those criteria must be met for the behaviour to be categorised as workplace bullying. Repeated behaviour refers to persistent, the persistent nature of the behaviour and can involve a range of behaviours over time. Unreasonable behaviour means behaviour that a reasonable person, having considered the circumstances, would see as unreasonable, including behaviour that is victimising, humiliating, intimidating or threatening. Workplace bullying does not include reasonable managerial action carried out in a reasonable way. So for example, the provision of fair feedback on a person's performance is not workplace bullying. Australian work health and safety legislation embraces a risk management approach to hazards in the workplace and this includes the psychological hazard we're talking about. Risk is often expressed in terms of a combination of the likelihood and consequences of an event with the context being taken into account and I'll explain that a little later perhaps. Risk assessment refers to the overall process of estimating the magnitude of risk. Of, of risk. And on this basis, the acceptability or unacceptability of risk is often decided upon. Risk control refers to the process of elimination or minimisation of risks. Safe Work Australia has developed guidance material in relation to workplace bullying based on a risk management approach. With the above in, my, in mind, let's uh, lead over to our case study. Mary has perceived certain negative changes at work. She alleges that Alice has repeatedly behaved unreasonably towards her. The situation is beginning to impact on her health. She can't sleep. She decides to consult her general practitioner and ask for sleeping tablets. Is this the way to go? I will now pass you over to our GP and occupational physician, Dr Neil Ozan, for his comments. Thanks, Anne. That's a really good opportunity, I think, for people to start thinking about the definitions and what it is we're talking about when, when we're talking about bullying. And it's bullying, and it's clear that there's some um, judgments in there. I can see from the chat that people are, are kind of giving some examples of where that might be. The judgment might not be quite right, but we might come back to some of those. So let's let's move across to you now, Neil, and give us yes, the GP occupational physician perspective. Thank you. The because Mary has gone to the GP, a lot of my talk will be from the GP perspective, but I can also talk a bit from the occupational physician one. 
because she moves come to me and my job as a GP is to look after my patient the best way that I can. And what I, what I want to work out is how is the best way to help Mary through this situation. But first of all, I'm going to need to know what's important to Mary. And I'm making the presumption that Mary, being 46, she went into nursing on the basis that she wants to do a good job caring for patients, looking after them, making them feel comfortable, helping them when they need things, and, <clears throat> and then go home and then come back the next day and look after patients again. She doesn't want to do what she now has to do, which is look after budgets and, and money and performance reviews and, and those sorts of things that didn't exist when she started. So I need to keep that perspective in mind when I'm looking at her. As an occupational physician, I'd be also wondering what's happening in the work and the workplace. And I want to be aware of how this will affect other workers, both um, both managers, but more importantly, other nurses in the hospital and are they being affected as well? As in, if I'm the occupational physician there, is this the is Mary the tip of the iceberg or the presenting problem, but there's a bigger problem underneath, or is Mary the only one with a problem? So to work that out, if I'm going to provide effective help, I need to know what's going on. I need a, a super good history, and this takes a long time. It takes a long time to get a history of what's happened, what the process is, what were things like before, when did they start to go bad, what were things like before Alice came along, and what are they like now. Have there been other changes in the workplace with the management system? Has the, um, why has Alice come to that workplace? Because um, there, are many, there are many factors that could be in effect here. Has their budget changed? Many things affect that. But more importantly for the topic of tonight is how am I going to be helping Mary? That's to work out, I need to know what's wrong with Mary. To do that, I need to know her background, which as her GP, I would have a reasonable idea, but I would want to be sure that I know what's her medical background. Is there something in her medical history that could be affecting her ability to perform the work? So I need to know if she, is there really some substance to Alice's uh, allegations that she's not working well? And is there some substance to Mary's allegations that Alice is bullying her? And so I need a bit of facts first. I need to know, is there something about uh, Mary in the past that her medical or her mental health might put her at risk of poor performance? And if so, I need to look at that as a separate issue. When I'm doing her examination, I, I want to be sure that there's no physical aspect that's going to be affecting her fitness for work either. Because if there is a problem with Mary's fitness for work, then it's a separate issue altogether. So I'm going to presume for the case here that Mary is actually doing OK as a nurse, perhaps not as an administrator, but she's doing a good job as a nurse still, and there's a problem with Alice, and Alice is being the bully. Now, to, to move on, effectively, what I've just been saying is that I need to really define the problem so that I understand what's happening. I can explain that to Mary along with the potential causes. And then I need to look at it as in Mary's my patient. What's wrong with her? Is a secondary mental health diagnosis appropriate, such as has, from this, has she become depressed and does she need treatment? Is she at risk to herself of self-harm? and suicide, and more commonly, is she going to be at harm of becoming workless in the future and having the health problems to go with not working? So my dilemma is, how am I going to talk to Mary? How am I going to broach all of these subjects with her? Do I make communication with the workplace, and if so, who and how? Mary's going to need some treatment, and who's going to do that? Who am I going to refer for to help with the counselling? And who's going to pay for it? Should I provide medication because she may have depression? Should I provide the sleeping tablets uh, that she's asked for? As a personal issue, my answer is just an absolute no. I hate the sleeping tablets. I always have, always will. Don't prescribe them ever. But should I prescribe something else? That's a question that will come later. Should I refer her? And if so, who to? Um, I need to be aware of the work options for her. Um, 
I'm aware of the health benefits of work. I would explain that very briefly to Mary. But what options does she have? Does she have the option of restricted duties? Does she have the option of working separate from Alice? And then the question is, should I certify her? And should I um, put her on to work as compensation or work cover? And now it's time to move on to Dr. Nigel Strauss. Thanks very much, Neil. That's a lot of things that GPs are thinking about. So there's a lot of decisions in there, a lot of information to be gathering, and, and I guess lots of, lots of things to be thinking through. So it sounds like um, there's lots there that we might pick up again on, later on. So let's now move on to the psychiatrist. So Nigel, let's hear your perspective in terms of, from a psychiatrist's point of view, what is it that, that you think is really important here to, to add to, to the other panellists? Well, um, there's certainly a um, lot of questions that have been um, a lot of questions. Certainly, a um, lot of questions that have been um, a lot of questions that have been asked by Neil, and they need to be answered. I think the the, the relevant point that I'd like to emphasise as a psychiatrist is that it's crucial. The aim should be to get Mary back to work as soon as possible. I've seen so many of these claims, uh, bullying claims, whereby People get caught in the system, medical workers compensation system, and uh, the whole process becomes very protracted. So the, the first point of contact for Mary is the general practitioner. And I think the practitioner has two roles, and um, I think that Neil's um, talked about those, but pre predominantly the first role is to be a good listener, to, to hear what Mary has to say, because from that very brief outline of the case, um, it appears that Mary hasn't been able to talk to anyone at work about what's happened. And this is so common in these claims where people feel very isolated in the workplace and because of circumstances in the workplace, there's no one they can confide, they can confide in. So they end up going to the general practitioner. There's nothing wrong with that, obviously. And the general practitioner's role is to listen and formulate what's going on. And it's important to emphasise that, of course, if you only have one side of the story, um, you don't know full facts if you're the GP, but um, it's important to accept what Mary's saying, that her perception of circumstances is accurate as far as she's concerned. Um, the next, the second aspect to consider in this is that um, communication needs to be established between um, Mary and her treater and the workplace. The workplace has to be informed as soon as possible about Mary's concerns. Now that doesn't guarantee that the, the workplace, the employer is necessarily going to respond appropriately, but hopefully uh, the employer will. And if they do, uh, there's good grounds for some sort of remedial action to get Mary back to work quickly uh, into another role or to establish some form of mediation between Mary and the person who's concerning her, who's upsetting her. Um, the main thing is to get the, the, the wheels rolling in the workplace. I, I repeat that that's not always possible, but if it is, then there's a good chance that uh, we can get Mary back to work quickly. So communication is important in setting up some sort of um, uh, dialogue between Mary, uh, the other worker and the employer with the assistance of a general practitioner. If the general practitioner doesn't feel that that's his or her role, then certainly um, another uh, treater, such as a psychologist, who's experienced in workplace circumstances, can step in and act as a sort of advocate and helper uh, for Mary and, and, and get this process rolling. Now, Neil touched on the, the, the concept of illness um, and whether one makes a diagnosis. Uh, I think initially it's important for the general practitioner to try and assume that Mary is simply upset uh, and that uh, if the situation at work can be resolved, this upset can be managed appropriately. On the other hand, if Mary presents with severe symptoms, then of course a diagnosis needs to be made. But um, I'm always uh, of the belief that we don't want this to be medicalised. We want this to be seen as a process of conflict, or potential conflict, or perceived conflict, which can be resolved and the upset and the distress can be rectified. Of course a diagnosis may be made if this doesn't occur, if the thing becomes more intractable and Mary's situation deteriorates. And similarly, does the general practitioner put in a workers' compensation plan? Um, this is another uh, big factor that um, can not always be necessarily helpful. So that if a claim is made, a workers' 
compensation claim is made, this can sometimes slow the whole healing process down and pro provoke more conflict. A lot of the employers are not happy with uh, claims being made. I'm not saying they should be avoided, but again, if this thing can be managed uh, quickly and efficiently by communication uh, and getting the worker back to work as quickly as possible, then hopefully the workers' compensation claim can be avoided because many times once a claim has been made, the wheels start turning and the situation um, can, uh, can just drag on and this will not be uh, good for Mary in the long term. So quick, uh, quick action, quick, good communication and uh, resolution as quickly as possible to, 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 to avoid this thing going on for too long and that I think is the important thing. Okay, so we've got lots of various information there from a range of perspectives. Um, and I guess seeing the chat, there's lots of ideas and lots of questions being asked about this and, and people certainly picking up on the complexity of this and the notions of power and, and how, how this plays out and um, I guess for some people the challenges that there might be when, when they're not heard or actions not taken. So I guess trying to trying to sort of stick with ideas that what what it is we can do. One is one of the suggestions that a number of people have made is taking it to HR. And it was something that some of the, the panelists talked about in terms of contacting the workplace. So maybe um, a question that I could put to anyone who'd like to answer it in the panel is what what would that be like as an approach? Contacting the HR people of the um, of the workplace where um, Mary is and who would do that and what might you need to think about. So is there anyone who'd like to jump in to get us talking about that as a possible option? Well, um, I think that um, human resources, it, it depends on the size of the organisation. In Mary's case, it's obviously a big organisation and human resources would be the aspect of the employment of the employer or the, the agency of the employer who should be contacted and hopefully the human resources department or officer will be of assistance in such a case. Um, yeah, okay. In a smaller organisation, you might have to ring the employer, but often human resources is the way or the place to go. Right. Okay. All right. So it sounds like that's a good a good thing to, to have in mind, particularly this early intervention period as well, when when it's sort of first conversations happening with the GP. All right. Thanks for that, Nigel. Peter, let's move on to you and, and I guess you're going to be thinking a bit about and talking to us a bit about that workplace and some of the things that might be happening there and, and some of that bigger picture um, aspect as well. So let's have a listen to what you might be thinking about from a psychologist's point of view. Okay. <clears throat> um, I, I'm in the fortunate position of coming last, so um, just to endorse everything that's been said previously, um, I, I suppose my sort of first point briefly was about not making assumptions. Um, there's a wide spectrum here. Um, there are dreadful things that do happen to some people in workplaces. I'm involved at the moment in a couple of prosecutions as an advisor. And, uh, but right up the other end of the spectrum, there are also people who have um, what the literature calls high trade emotionality. Um, and they are overly sensitive and they relabel what uh, Anne referred to as reasonable management action as, as terrible um, actions uh, undertaken against them. Um, so we've got to be careful not to make assumptions. Um, the other points that both Nigel and Neil made around not medicalising low morale, that's critical because we do see iatrogenic effects here where some people get worse as a result of the treatment they get. Um, the early re-engagement with employment is absolutely critical. Um, uh, the longer people stay off work, the worse they get. <coughs> um, People in a work, once the claim's been made, there are things about workers' compensation systems that um, are associated with worse outcomes. Same with surgery, physical outcomes as with mental health outcomes. So we want to minimise people's involvement in the workers' comp system. Uh, we want to minimise uh, medicalising low morale. So I think as Nigel said, in communication, engagement with the workplace as early as possible. If it happens to be an unreasonable workplace and you're not getting anywhere, uh, in Victoria, which I'm most familiar with, but other states have the same function, we have worksafe psychosocial inspectors who can go out and pay a visit um, if you're not getting anywhere with HR. But certainly that should be the top of the list, early re-engagement with the workplace. 
Um, but if things fall off the, the perch and, and you're not getting anywhere, um, all of the state workers' comp authorities and, and regulators have those sorts of functions where they can pay visits to workplaces. Um, another quick thing to slip in is around certification. So I'm not quite going to my slides, but um, what we find is that um, often GPs and, and physios who certify in some states now too is there's a mindset of either total incapacity or total capacity. But you can certify partial capacity and even put in place some restrictions. And I think Nigel uh, mentioned this and, and, and Neil as well, that um, uh, it may be a reporting restriction if it happens to involve a, a, a troubled relationship with a manager. You can certify can't talk to that man or can't report to that manager. Um, so those sorts of things are realistic. But we, we must focus on re-engagement with employment. Um, the longer people stay off work, and I think there's a next slide or two talks to that, um, the, the worse their outcome, the less likely they are to get back to work. Um, so uh, the mental health of unemployed Australians is actually up to four times worse than people engaged in employment. Um, the OECD and the whole health benefits of work agenda, which uh, uh, Neil mentioned, indicates that engagement with employment is better for people's recovery and better for people's mental health, and that's absolutely critical. So the whole agenda nationally around re-engaging with employment, it's not about nothing to do with cutting costs for insurers, it is about people's long-term mental health and wellbeing outcomes. Um, uh, <clears throat> the problem, uh, in terms of when psychologists get involved, um, the, the challenge is that most of our psychologists in private practice are engaged in the Medicare system, they have their set 10 sessions, um, it doesn't matter what you do between beginning and end, um, but in this jurisdiction you have to get um, very directive, very strong, and, and the first point to make is you must not reinforce avoidance behaviours. Um, avoidance behaviours, uh, we, we do see a lot of cases where people, it's iatrogenic, people are being made worse by the treatment they've had. They get reinforced into victimhood, blaming the employer, blaming everyone else, and particularly if they're up that high emotionality end of the spectrum, um, you've got to have a completely different approach. Um, you need to go in strongly, so um, motivational interviewing to sort of work out, you know, um, if you don't re-engage with work, this is the prospect in terms of worse outcome. Um, often in this population too, lots of pre-existing things get stirred up, but you still need to try and quarantine, that's what the best clinicians do, um, we, we do over 1,200 uh, secondary treatment reviews a year in, in WorkSafe on what we call the clinical panels um, and the best clinicians try and quarantine that and really focus on current functioning, trying to get back to re-engaging with employment. Um, then you might concurrently, subsequently, uh, look at some of those underlying issues. Um, so the sort of generic supportive counselling where you unwittingly reinforcing misattributions, it's all um, you must be very active and the framework we use and this has been adopted nationally across all workers' comp jurisdictions, it's a thing called the clinical framework which you, you can access on New South Wales, Comcare, Vic, uh, Victoria, etc, etc website and it just details the principles of sort of active treatment that need to be employed in this space. Um, I did want to end on a positive note because I think I'm about <laughs> running out of time. Um, I could talk a lot more about that, but on, on the positive end, um, there are a lot of good things happening. I do see uh, in Victoria we've just uh, produced some um, psychosocial guidance materials for employers. Um, I do a lot of work in the space that's called incivility, which is low-level negative stuff in the workplace that, that if you don't check it, it, it can morph into bullying downstream. Um, but a lot of employers are really keen on that notion. And so um, establishing strong values and behaviour piece in the workplace, um, et cetera, holding people accountable, having uh, people-related KPIs in, in managed performance. There, there are a lot of good things actually happening out there. Uh, probably the, the overriding big challenge, and, and, and I think uh, Nige, uh, sorry, Neil alluded to this, um, you know, um, Mary's morph role is morphing over time. Um, there, there's a macro sort of thing about where change intersects with globalisation, whatever, whatever. Um, so uh, it's a real challenge as we move forward in terms of the safety nets we have, 
um, the pace of change. Uh, Comcare put into place uh, uh, last year a, a, a sort of psychosocial checklist for reviewing organisational change because a lot of claims come as a consequence of change. Um, so um, these are all big things. Um, perhaps the final thing to note, um, uh, I was involved with Mary White who's not physician and we did a review for Safe Work Australia and just to note that above and beyond treatment, the support that people perceive from the workplace is an absolutely critical factor that either facilitates, uh, derails or hinders their return to work. So above and beyond clinical treatment, the workplace has an absolutely critical role to play in this whole uh, process. It's the treaters, uh, the workplace, working in partnership to try and progress and improve those return to work outcomes. So yeah, so there's a lot of good stuff happening in the prevention space as well. Um, but that's probably enough for me. So thank you very much. And we'll move on, I think, Lynn, to questions, whatever. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Peter. And the, the passion just comes through, doesn't it? I know you could be here all night. <laughs> I, thought, I don't know how I'm going to stop him, but I'm glad you did that. So thank you. Um, look, I, I think there's probably lots of questions. I know we've got lots of questions coming through when people register. We asked them for questions and we had lots of questions. And and just looking at the chat, we can we can see talk, people talking about how how this is, is really happening a lot and how there's, there's kind of a sense of helplessness, I guess. So I was really pleased, Peter, that you ended with that positive note and that, that notion of prevention. But if we, if we do go back to thinking about Mary in this, this case, there's, there's the part about supporting Mary and working out what, what we need to do to support her. But there is the, the issue of Alice in the workplace. So any of the panellists, I guess the first question is any, any kind of reflections or thoughts given, if you've been keeping an eye on the chat, um, that sense of things not working or the management won't listen or people don't, you know, they don't want to, Mary might not want to go to HR, um, EAP might, might be limited in what they can do. So any of the panellists wanting to kind of give us any, any reflections on that and, and again with that kind of strategy hopefulness that, that I think is really going to be most helpful for us tonight. Anyone like to start? Neil's got a comment. Yep. Um, my, my comment is, is to pick up on something that Peter mentioned, which is to focus on the function. And I think to focus on c capacity, what Mary can do and Mary's function, what she is doing, and maintaining that, supporting that and helping her increase that is probably the most important thing here. Far more important than focusing on what's Mary feeling bad about, what are her symptoms and what are her problems. Because if you focus on those symptoms and problems, she'll focus on them, then she'll think about them more and they'll become worse, which is a self-fulfilling prophecy. What we need to do more than anything is to help her focus on how she can make things better. Yeah. So is that like an empowerment, working towards empowering her? Is that, would that be how you describe that, Neil, in terms of helping her think about what it is she can do? Would that be part of that focus? Yes, that's part of it. Part, and a large part of that is going to be talking with the the workplace, talking with people to help in, in, uh, maintain Mary's usefulness because if someone's saying this, this person is useless, they're no good, they're no good, they're no good but then effectively all you're going to do is drive them away mm -hmm. even more, make the problem even worse and that's worse for the workplace as well as being worse for Mary. So as a GP treating Mary, that's going to be bad. As an occupational physician that might be involved with the hospital, that's going to be bad for that too. So thing I like about treating any of these things is what's good for one party is also good for another party. Everybody benefits by doing the right thing. So it sounds like that's the way in then. If you're wanting to get management or HR involved, that's, that's the angle then in terms of what it is that's going to work for them as well. It's not just about Mary, it's about the whole the system. Sounds like someone else gonna... wants to talk. Is that you, Peter? Oh, uh, yeah, look, uh, two things. Uh, if it becomes a claim in Victoria and, and other states uh, have parallel and, and are developing this direction, we have a scheme called Workplace Support Service, which means that um, the, the claims are triage and where it looks like more an interpersonal barrier than a medical barrier to return to work, a, a rehab provider with skills is appointed to liaise between the worker and the employer and try and resolve those interpersonal barriers. So that brings in a third party who's experienced in this space and understands what the employer obligations are and, and pursues that in, in that direction. Um, the other thing in, in the very positive end of the spectrum is you know, Beyond Blue is out there promoting the notion of mentally healthy workplaces. 
some employers are actually embracing that space. They're doing more to hold managers accountable at different levels for behaviours, managing behaviours, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there are some positive things at that end as well. Right. Yeah. Thanks, Peter. So it does seem like whilst we're talking about this as being a very big problem, it, it does sound like there's a bit of a culture shift that, that's starting to happen. In takes time, obviously. Anyone else like to comment on on any of that in terms of what what can happen in terms of the roles that you might have or that health professionals who are in the audience tonight might be able to play in terms of engaging the the employer, having the management. Um, talked with or HR contacted or mediation might be another another um, possibility that I've seen raised in the chat as well. Nigel, any thoughts? Um, well, all those all those um, techniques or points of communication are important. I, I don't want to be the prophet of doom, but um, some of the um, workplaces are very resistant to any suggestions and and and. As much as you know, I'm, I'd like to be optimistic. I think there are still a lot of uh, recalcitrant um, employers who make it extremely difficult uh, to get uh, workers back to work, and uh, we can't deny that they do exist. And, and it can be a real struggle um, to to try and bring about mediation or communication with human resources. And in, in, in those cases, I think it's very important to protect people like Mary. Um, from being battered and bruised and continuing to be affected by the mistreatment. And I think that, that we have to keep that in mind. And even though we do make attempts to get her back to work quickly, if, that's in, if that becomes quite quickly apparent that it's not going to happen, then we have to do everything to protect her. And talk about other possibilities if indeed going back to work is only going to make it feel worse. So maybe even encouraging you to look for work elsewhere. I'm not, I'm, saying, I'm not saying that's necessarily the approach, but it might be something we have to consider. Certainly we have to look after her, and that's like the primary concern of the treater, at least, I think, in cases like this. Yeah. So keeping Mary at the centre. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I can, I can see people talking about that workplaces are quite different. So for some people, we're talking about family businesses or talking about very small businesses where there's not a HR. There's not necessarily an employment assistance program to go to. So I guess that, that means that that's even more challenging. So any thoughts about that if we are talk, working with someone who's, who's part of you know, a very small business and some of those um, structures aren't in place? Any ideas about that? And, and maybe thinking about you know, what, is, what are the options um, outside of um, that, that employment place itself? Just, just a quick comment there. Um, uh, Peter here, can you yes. hear me? Yes, yeah. Peter. Just, just a quick comment that um, certainly the, the, the data for small employers uh, from a, a workers' comp scheme perspective is worse um, because if the alleged bully is, is the owner of the business and there's only three or four employees, there's not much you can do in terms of alternative reporting, etc. Um, also, as has been mentioned, they don't often have uh, the capacity to have a HR function. Um, so. Um, WorkSafe, small business associations, um, Blue Beyond Blue have developed various sort of guidance materials there, but it is a bit of a gap. Often the option needs to be looked at as a return to alternative employment. Um, of course, uh, you know, if we try and focus on moving upstream, if we can get to these things earlier, um, mediation, as has been mentioned, can be a very valuable tool, um, but it does have a window of opportunity. Often it's applied too late. Uh, and, and it becomes ineffectual and a, and a waste of space. Um, but yeah, we've got to acknowledge there is a real ongoing challenge for small business. In the UK, they've piloted uh, programs around uh, government funding to provide a sort of HR service that supports small business. Um, so there's various initiatives around that, that try to address that issue, but it is an ongoing challenge. Yep, great. Okay, thank you. Now, Anne, I can see that you're wanting to participate in this discussion, but we've had a little, little bit of it's a gone past, hit with Anne. It's all gone past. Um, to you now. Well, it, it, I think a lot of the things that I would have liked to have said, the opportunity has gone past, but there's a couple of things I'd like to reinforce that um, um, Peter spoke about, uh, and Nigel as well. In some cases, we have to face that the person needs to leave. And that often happens in a small business. For example, if it's a, say a small estate agent and it's a family run business and somebody goes in, um, generally the person you'd report the problem to is also going to be the perpetrator 
and um, it's often the case that that decision may be the best for the person to make, unfortunately. That's very difficult for some people, particularly if they're working in um, regional areas where there's no um, great opportunity for other employment and that sort of thing. Um, the other thing I just want to stress that mediation used too late can be, um, as Peter said, more harmful um, than useful and there's a number of reasons for that. As Peter said, more harmful um, than useful and there's a number of reasons for that. Um, obviously if something has gone into full blow and bullying, there's an absence of trust and you know, mediation involves the voluntary, um, um, it's a voluntary intervention and it does mean that people need to, um, to enter the situation in good faith and if there's a fear that the other person isn't doing that, um, then I've seen it cause a lot more harm than, than uh, being helpful. I just wanted to emphasise that mediation is great for conflict, but once it's blown into um, to, to full bullying, then it may in fact be another layer of bullying of itself if a person feels that they have to enter a mediation situation when they really don't want to. Mm. So, so they're, they're, they're feeling comfortable and, and understanding the, the potential impact of that is really important. Okay, okay, great, great. Thank, thank you. you. Now we've got lots, lots and lots of possible questions, questions we could go to, um, but I'll go back to some of them that, that came through earlier on and, and one of them was around the role of the family and we've, we've sort of identified with Mary that she was keeping this quite secret from home even though her husband was sort of on to the fact that something was not, not going quite right for her. What, would anyone like to comment on the impact on the family um, or the way that you might engage with the family and any any kind of aspects around the family, considering the family in this when Mary might have different ideas about whether she wants to wants to engage with that or not. But any examples of how that might be useful? Anyone? Well, yeah, I, uh, it's Nigel. Um, I think that the family is a crucial factor in all of this and cannot be denied and uh, inevitably in these types of situations the families become involved and uh, the secret can't be kept and I think it's important that uh, uh, the, the family be considered because um, if there is a, a good supportive family around the worker then the outcomes are much better. The, the worker will need support because the, uh, as Freud said there's um, only two things that are important in life and that's love and work and if work's not going well we need as much love as we can get and we need a lot of support from the family and uh, it would be good for the trees to talk to other family members, particularly the spouse, obviously, yeah. uh, and uh, then discussions could be broadened. And uh, if there are discussions about, say, leaving the job, then of course the spouse is important. And I think that um, if these things become protracted, then one has to be careful, or one must be aware as a tree that there often are strains on the marriage, emotionally, financially, and so forth. And these have to be monitored and maybe managed as well either by the general practitioner or by a psychologist, whoever's involved. Yeah. So of course, with all these um, issues, the, the family is imperative and uh, needs to be involved and needs to be uh, helpful and informed. Yeah, great. Yeah, really comprehensive answer. Thanks, Nigel. Now, I'm just looking at the time, and I know that we're just really wa just warming up and we could keep going, but we've got um, six minutes before we finish. So. I'd love to keep answering questions and I can see the discussions happening, I can see people providing ideas to each other and lots of um, people agreeing with some of the things that panellists have talked about and sharing ideas and other people raising some new concerns and it's obviously complex and there's lots, lots to think about. But we do need to wind up so I'm keen to give each of the panellists a couple of minutes to really just any summary reflection um, take home message I guess. So Anne, let's start with you. A message um, that, that I take from this and that I would like the audience to take from this is the earlier the intervention the better. Everybody wins. Um, this means that encouragement of reporting uh, needs to occur. What happens once the reporting has occurred needs to be resourced and um, the, um, the situation where um, follow-up is, is required um, needs to be done very carefully. I would still endorse that um, a person who feels that they're being um, bullied in the workplace uh, sees their GP in the first instance. But earlier, er, the earlier the reporting the better. 
Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Great. Great. So, so early, early messaging is really important to be able to act and have more options. Would that be the main message there? That having more options the earlier of the intervene, the prognosis. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And better outcome. And yeah. Better outcome. Okay. okay. Yep. yep. I've just had some messages from MHPN that I've got a little bit more time than I thought. So we can um, take a little bit more time to do these, these messages. So Anne, if you've got anything else you want to add, you could do that or I can come back to you. Well, I'd just like to say that um, this, this whole reporting thing is, is, is very, um, very fraught. It often, reporting often falls on deaf ears um, and that we really need to educate people um, who are responsible for workplaces and for the health and safety of people in the workplaces that, that they must accept um, early reporting and resource what, what interventions need to happen from there. Um, these problems don't go away generally, they get worse. Um, and so you know, my plea is for everybody involved in this, in this area to encourage and, um, and see through the red flags that people raise by reporting and to encourage people to report. There's also a whole lot of um, under-reporting. There may be over-reporting but there's also under-reporting. The criminologists call that the dark figure and yeah. there are people who um, feel they just can't report for various reasons and we need to troubleshoot that and find out what are the constraints on people feeling they can uh, report um, and have a look at how we can um, overcome those constraints. Yeah. Okay. So looking out for these signs early on and taking it seriously if people raise concerns. And also, okay. yeah, um, other people who might see someone in strife uh, mm -hmm. taking some steps to assist. Yeah, yep. great. great. Okay. okay. Good, thank, thank you. you. Who'd like to go next in this sort of extended final comments or uh, take home messages? Who'd like to, to go next? In <laughs> Neil, I'll go next. Someone's dog wants to have something to say. Yeah, the dog, the <laughs> dog wants to go first. Uh, I, I agree exactly with what Anne said. The earlier the better. Before things get too bad, before things get worse, before they have time to become entrenched, the more people that get involved who are around the outside of it, the worse things will get because all that will happen with that is that Mary will focus more and more on what bad things are happening, how bad it is, how bad it is, how bad it is, which will make her worse and everything will get worse. We need to focus on getting Mary assessed, get her function maintained, what she has got, we want it maintained, we want it supported, we want her lifted. We also want to be able to help work become a better place to work and we want to help, Alice probably needs some help too, she'll need some education. I would hope that because Alice is also a nurse that she's got hopefully some good qualities about her mm. but she probably needs a bit of education on how to take on her role that she hasn't been trained for either. So mm. we've got two, two people who are both trained to do one job, both being asked to do another job, neither of them really, uh, well one of them at least doesn't like it and the other one probably doesn't like it either mm. but um, it's just a, a, a bad situation that they're both in but it can be helped and we need to on how to help them rather than what problems there are. Yep. Okay, so that, that thinking about the underlying causes of the bullying, I guess, is what, you, what you're saying there, isn't it? In terms of not just seeing the bullying as happening in isolation from nowhere or some nastiness, it might be maybe happening as part of something that's happening yeah. to Alice as well. Yeah, we don't know whether Alice is, what pressure Alice is under, but mm. then being passed on to Mary. Yeah. And to finish with, with talking with Mary and the family, we, we we can't re have to be sure that we don't go direct to the family. We have to get Mary to go to the family or at least have her permission to go to the family. Yep. But for Mary it's going to be hard for her because she's the nurse looking after other people and she's not patient usually. So mm. she has to be encouraged and authorised so that she can be the patient and that she can seek help and ask her husband because she's probably thinking that she's protecting him but He's probably feeling that he's been excluded and left out of it and he'd like to be able to help. Yep. So we need to encourage and authorise, allow Mary to be that person. Mm. Yep. And he's being his, his partner struggling with something that's impacting yeah. him too probably. I can, thanks Neil, I can see that um, there's, a, there's a comment about peer reviewed academic research and findings that, that the whole topic, the area that perhaps isn't um, 
there isn't a lot of that. So I, I'm wondering, Peter or Nigel, if that's something that you might want to just pick up on. Well, we've got a moment. It's come through in, in the comments. So any any comments around academia and research around this topic you want to pick up on or alert people to where they might find out some information? Cool. <laughs> <laughs> I got you there. I can give you some thinking time and come back. Yeah, could I, could I just um, make some final comments uh, yeah. while Peter's talking about that? Um, yeah, sure. But, um, I think that, you know, these bullion case, it, it, we, we mustn't generalise too much about bullying. Each case has to be seen on its own merits. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's very hard to summarise. I think that um, bullying is, an, is a relative term, and I think that um, some people can withstand um, behaviour at work that other people can't withstand. So personality factors are relevant. Um, I think we have to look at the organisational structures, the leadership of organisations that uh, sometimes bullying, bullying unfortunately is uh, very common in an organisation because people uh, who are in charge manifest that behaviour. So we have to look at the, the structure of the organisation itself. Um, I think the way that uh, misbehaviour in particular organisations is dealt with is also important. Whether we like it or not, the human resources uh, function doesn't always work very well and there's a lot of discussion about whether uh, the human resources departments are working for the employer or working for the employees um, and, and that can vary too. Um, what, uh, so what I'm saying is what one person might call bullying, another person might not call bullying. And as we all know, there's been a lot of publicity about uh, bullying in recent times. And um, although it's a good thing that it's been accepted and uh, taken into consideration, sometimes um, I think that people um, cry wolf too often. So um, I, I, I think that bullying exists. I have no doubt that it does, and it can cause terrible harm, and uh, uh, it can cause illness and so forth. But um, the, the, the people who manage it and treat it have to take each case as they come and try and get, and, and in psychiatry this is very important, as much information about each case as possible as it can be possibly obtained. Mm. Because um, there are always two sides to the story and uh, if we have those two sides it makes it easier to decide upon what's actually happened and how we can manage the situation. Yep. Getting as much information as possible. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I can see, Anne, you've um, put a note in the in the chat about some peer-reviewed literature. So you're talking there about mobbing. It's, it's called mobbing in the Northern European literature. If people are looking for that, so people might be doing a literature search, um, I'd be putting in mobbing as well as bullying. A lot of the Northern European uh, researchers, um, some of whom I met recently in Auckland, uh, do still use the term mobbing. Um, which we tend to use in Australia as a term when we're saying it's a group of people um, uh, mobbing either an individual or another group. Uh, whereas in Northern Europe, they think they, they tend to use the term mobbing to also to mean yeah. bullying. So it's just another term to put into your search yeah. if you're making one. All right. All right. Thanks, Thanks Anne. Anne. Now, Peter. Yeah. Yes. You can talk about research if you <laughs> if you've got some thoughts. Now, I've given you some thinking um, look, time, I, or you I, can do it around. Yeah, look, I'd rather not talk much about research. Um, mm -hmm. Anne's talked to that. Um, yep. Most of the research is in the school bullying space. Yeah. There are studies in the in the workplace bullying space, but it, it's a literature that's pretty disparate. Um, yep. Probably the two things I just wanted to quickly conclude on was number one, um, and, and Anne will will emphasise this as well that um, uh, all jurisdictions are starting to emphasise psychological health and safety uh, mm -hmm. as distinct from physical health and safety. Um, that's becoming more and more prominent. Under the law, uh, they're equal, um, but it's still working its way through uh, Australian society and, and workplaces that the obligations are the same. Uh, in Victoria, we're just developing a whole of government approach uh, utilising what are called the Canadian standards um, uh, around psychological health and safety. Safe Work Australia has done a lot of work in this space, so there are good things happening there. The, the one thing I did want to conclude on, because there's probably a lot of people on this webinar, but psychologists in particular, who get referred people that's fairly downstream. So the, the, the person's gone to the GP, the GP's done certain things um, and pro probably provided maybe some sleeping pills if they didn't go to see Neil, um, but um, <laughs> uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then 
let's refer to the psychologist. So by the time they get to you, they're fairly downstream. I just want to say that the couple of things, when I see people in that space, I do what's called motivational interviewing on steroids. Like you've got to go in really strongly, you're at high risk, I will get family members, allies, whoever wants to come in, relatives, get them all in, lay it all out about the risk. You have, we have to get you re-engaged with alternative employment. We've got to get you active and functioning. So you've got to be doing exercise every day. If you prescribe mindfulness, for example, don't just give the person a CD. They must rigorously do it every single day and be accountable for that. You've got to get them very, it's like a military training regime because the longer you go on like this, the less likely you are to ever get back to work. Um, yeah. Don't focus on the underlying stuff. Recognise it, acknowledge it, quarantine it. Do a bit of EMDR if you need to to sort of sideline it. That's what a lot of experienced clinicians do. But you've got to focus on functioning and re-engagement as best as possible with alternative employment, whatever. All the Australian schemes have uh, an equivalent of what we in Victoria call the new employer scheme. If you're not going back to the same job, uh, the vocational uh, rehab people help you to sort of identify skills and go to an alternative job. Um, but you must do that intensively and full on because every day goes on, the risk increases that you will never get back to employment. And as we said earlier, the mental health of unemployed Australians is on average up to four times worse than people engaged in employment. So um, don't just do the sort of empathy, ventilation, support. You've got to be very directive, very full on, and get them doing stuff really actively between every session. Mm -hmm. Thanks. <laughs> yep, okay, good. <laughs> I like the way you, you know that you Keep going again. I got that sense. <laughs> now, just one last question, which is kind of a wrapping up question. One of the one of the really interesting questions you had early on was if you could develop a five step quick reference guide for healthcare professionals assisting clients who've been subject to workplace bullying. What would those five cornerstone steps be? So, would anyone like to have a a wrap up final final wrap up now um, of five cornerstone steps? So, it might be one each or it might be a couple that people want to throw in. So what would be the cornerstone step? Who likes to have a step? Communication? Absolutely. Well, yeah. communication and empathy, I think. Um, okay, two. Communication, empathy, any others? Cornerstone. This is assessment. Holistic approach. Holistic approach, Neil? Uh, it's a holistic approach. You need to look at, uh, at Mayor and Alice and the workplace and everything and put it all together to then come up with the final answer. answer. Yeah. Okay. Great. So communication, empathy, holistic approach. And any, any one cornerstone point? I know that it sounds like empathy, but I will also add the word caring. So many people say to me, and of course the people I meet are end stage, their, their lives are ruined. Um, and they say, if only the workplace cared. They never visited me, they never wanted to know how I was, they never followed me up, blah, blah, blah. And the word that I do hear all the time is caring. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And Peter? Uh, uh, look, I'm, I'm just going to rip off Anne and say that, uh, again, um, with the review um, I've been involved with with Safe Work Australia, the, the, the perception of workplace support is so important. And some employers get it and are gradually getting it, um, but where, where the perception of support is poor, that really reinforces that trajectory onto long-term disability. So employers need to be more accountable for that. We're starting to head in that direction with the emphasis on psychological health and safety. Mm -hmm. So let's let's move on as quick as we can in that direction. Okay, great, thank you. So it's been a big a big session. I can see that the dogs that have joined us with all the people who have logged on as well are getting a bit upset with your dog Neil. So we we began Let's before the session dog. started. We uh, we had a cat walking through the background of one <laughs> one of our panelists. So now we've had dogs barking and people telling us that that's then set their dogs off. So we've, we've had a bit of an interesting time. And then of course I, I didn't know what time it was. So thank you for persevering with us. And hopefully this has been a really useful, um, some useful ideas, certainly not pollution. I, I think we obviously have a long way to go, but it does sound from the comments in the chat and from the panelists as well that there's, there's a lot of progressive um, action happening and long way to go, but certainly some recognition and some actions that we probably didn't have 10 years ago or so. 
So let's um, move to the last couple of um, things we need to talk about now. So we have an exit survey when you do, um, when the webinar does finish, there'll be an exit survey, a survey that comes up that we would like you to take the little bit of time to complete. The certificates of attendance will, um, will come out the next couple of weeks, you'll receive those. And you will also receive a link to online resources that, that come out um, after in about a week's time as well. In terms of some MHPN webinars coming up, there's a Department of Veteran Affairs um, series of six webinars that are focused on supporting the mental health of veterans and the first one of those is called Understanding the Military Experience from Warrior to Civilian and that's going to be held on Tuesday the 16th of August 2016 and the other work that MH are, in, are doing are with APS which is where I work and this is a webinar as part of the forced adoption project that, that we're working on and I'll be facilitating this one um, and that's forced adoption best practice principles. And that will be on Wednesday the 24th of August 2016. So we'd love to see you join us for those. Um, and we would also like to encourage you to think about joining an MHPN network in your local area. And we, there's a link there for you to um, have a look at some of the MHPN networks that are, that are there already and an opportunity for you to, to join up there as well. And also a reminder, if you haven't already, to have a look at, at the networks and the online activities on the MHPN website. I'd certainly like to um, acknowledge the consumers and carers who've lived with um, mental illness in, in the past, people who are living with experiences of bullying and, and suffering from those experiences and, and continue to live with mental illness at the moment. So um, certainly when we're, when we're talking about this work, it, it does really bring, bring that home in terms of um, the work that we're doing and the importance of that work. I'd like to really thank the panel for their participation, their energy and their enthusiasm and it does feel like the time has gone incredibly quickly and that we've, we've touched the surface but people will be able to access the resources that are, that are there and have a look at those and, and I guess from um, their own sort of state and territory perspective have a, have a look at what might be relevant um, and hopefully you, you did find this very useful and, and can go away with, it, with a couple of ideas and, and some um, hope that things, things might get better as, as the years go by. So thank you panel and thank you to all the participants and the behind the scenes people and um, we'll finish there. So good evening everyone. Thank you.